Hello, I'm Alex Orr, chair of the subcommittee of the Conservation Commission, who is reviewing um, a policy document on how we use conservation land. And today is December 19. And we have present staff of Amherst, Aaron Chuck, and David Zomack, director of conservation and development. And we have commissioners Bruce Stedman, Michelle Lobb. And today we have an agenda where, which has been posted if there's any public uh, on, on who is going to uh, be with us. We wish you would make yourself known. <clears throat> and we're first going to discuss an agricultural session that we've all commented on. And then we're going to talk about uh, some policy questions that we need to address and uh, discuss our next agenda. And we have a list of site visits that we're going to talk about. And I'm gonna ask that maybe we can get done with the policy, dis I mean, the discussion of agricultural session in 20 minutes, but no longer than 30, so that we have plenty of time to talk about the other issues. So with that, does anybody have any comments? Uh, Michelle has her hand up, yes. Yeah, I just have to go in about 25 minutes, that's all. Do you want to flip this around, uh, flip this around so that you make sure your questions are addressed before you go? Um, no, I think we should go for the agricultural section. I'd like to be part of the discussion. Um, maybe if you're going to start scheduling site visits or anything, then we can do that via email too or something like that. Yeah, because... Um... Did you see that Dave sent out a list of site visits? I did, yep. Okay, so when we get to that, I was going to suggest that we focus on agricultural sites first, just because we're dealing with the agricultural policy and trying to stay focused. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. We'll talk about it then, but in case you have to scoot, that's what I was going to suggest. And then scheduling a time for that, uh, we'll get back to you on what your availability is. Okay, Bruce, um, maybe Aaron can bring up the document that shows everybody's comments and you can lead us through it. Can you make it bigger? Is that better? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I, I largely agree with all of Alex's um, finer grained edits. Um, I think we should focus on the questions. So first question I raised was why the licenses are so short. And you see my comment there about one to three years is somewhat of a disincentive in some cases. So I'd like to talk about whether the licenses can be longer. Dave, do you have a point of view, I'm sure? Yeah. Um, no, I totally understand where you're coming from, Bruce. That was some feedback we've gotten. Um, I think, so So this document came out of a period where the commission at that time was working with the Agricultural Commission, and and we were trying to pump some new life into this process of RFPing conservation land for agriculture. And I think the commission at the time felt like they needed to go slowly. And um, they wanted to really, you know, go at a pace that they felt comfortable with. And that's why um, the short licenses were selected. That was in large part what it was all about. And, and just feeling their way through getting a couple of these going. So having gotten some going, what is our experience? Not many got going, <laughs> to be honest. Not many got going. It, it, got, it got to be, um, it got to be, uh, part of it was a staff time issue, a, a resource issue. Just managing these things takes people power, right? And um, and focus. And I think um, at the time we, we got between uh, um, 
wetlands administrators and we had some changes in departments. So I think it never really got off the ground. So I, I'd, I'd be open I, if other commissioners, if commissioners would be open to considering longer licenses, because I think it is kind of a, it is a deterrent. Aaron. So I <clears throat> completely agree. And I've gotten some feedback from um, some members of the public who were prospective um, folks to bid on the license where they basically said, you know, that it takes one to three years just to prep the soils. Um, and so it, signing on for that, you basically put a ton of work to to amend the soils before you're even really able to produce anything. Um, so that was a good piece of feedback. The other thing was, <clears throat> and this was an interesting one too, um, it might be good to leave it open to have a choice and or we might want to break it out. I know Stephanie um, Ciccarello, the sustainability director, said that previously they had tried to start a an incubator farm um, program where people who were like recent graduates of uh, like, a, um, um, I forget, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the school, but like the, the um, UMass School of Agriculture, Stockbridge, yeah, Stockbridge, Stockbridge School of Agriculture, um, that they might want to do like a two-year license um, as an incubator just to try it out and see if it works for them without taking on like a 10-year license. So just to put that out there as food for thought. Thanks, Michelle. I was just going to add that, you know, going through the rest of this policy, there's a lot of upfront work just to um, be in compliance with the policy and making a management plan. So, yeah, one seems like not enough time at all. So that, yeah, I agree with opening it up for flexibility and maybe having, maybe talking about why it wouldn't be continued or like, you know, two years to five years with renewal and renewals based, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Might I suggest um, that we focus on solutions and uh, cut the um, agreement type conversation short so we can get through this. It's a fairly long document and there's a lot of comments. Could I suggest that, that we consider uh, changing this, the wording to an upper limit, no more than or something of that sort, so that on a case by case basis, the term can be determined. Let's let's split the difference and call it no more than seven and see how the rest of the commission feels. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm fine with that as long as we have a review, you know, as long as we have a you know a robust review process. You know, how's it going? We need to do check-ins. We can't just kind of let things slide. So I'm fine. I'm yeah. fine with five to seven years as long as we build in checks and balances. Yeah, what I was trying to get at earlier is then maybe after two years, there is some kind of review and there's like actual measures by which there's a decision to renew or not renew so that it's not just kind of subjective and up, you know, everybody knows what the expectation is and what um, isn't allowed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it does have yeah. review in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. yep. So maybe... When I redo this for the next draft, I can put those two review things together, find find the place, put them together, and then we'll talk about how this all reads when it's redone. Um, the next one, Alex uh, raised the question about comparing our um, the fee to other places. And I haven't gone out there to do that, but I'm willing to do that in between now and the next time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can I add a little background to um, when I was thinking about the fee? Amherst incurs cost every time its staff is involved with conservation land. And we don't think about much about recovering that cost, particularly like, for example, we were talking about community gardens and we had a fee in there and Dave said um, the town really wasn't interested in a fee for good reason. But there is an opportunity for us to recoup some some of our costs. And um, that, that's part of my question of bringing this up. I, I think it's a good one. Um, 
we actually have a line in our budget um, and have for years as to how many acres are currently being leased or excuse me, leased or licensed. And um, yeah, there in years past, there was, you know, some a decent amount of money coming in for for these kinds of things. So I think it's it's a good and 125 was years ago. I mean, that's been a placeholder right. for 10 years. Uh, I'll look into it. Never changed. Yep. Okay, thanks, Bill. So we'll see something else when you, when you come back. Good. Uh, the next one is Aaron talking about insurance. I don't know whether I'm in the in authorized to go check with the insurance company or she needs to do that, but one of us should do it. Uh, this is a this is a non-starter for the town. It has to happen. So there's not much debate on it. Uh, we did a lot of research on this. Okay, then uh, um, then we just leave it the way it is. Yeah, it's sounds we like had, we're done here. Yeah, we had town attorney uh, involved in okay. this, but you know, somebody using tractors, yeah. equipment, they get hurt. They're yeah. coming after the town for sure. Where the deepest pockets going? I think so that the oh, sounds sorry. like we're done with this one. Oh, Aaron, no, I'd like to hear what did what were you going to say, Aaron? I think that it was the question was raised as to whether that was enough because again that had been a placeholder for quite a while and oh. I think it was whether whether the current liability was whether a million is enough okay. or if we should require more. Okay, Aaron, then what? it goes. Aaron could reach out to um, through Holly Bowser. Why don't you do that, Aaron, and and see if a million is enough? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. And get back to Bruce so that he can work it in. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we need to scroll now. Yeah, we got daylight hours. And I also have, excuse me, but I I have a comment about who's involved. Uh, it it gets it gets all mixed up in the next couple of items. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, I just I raised the question. Um, there, there are clearly farmers who work in non-day life, and that's that's part of the the ethos. So I I don't know. Mm. Is that a legal requirement? Why do we even have it in here? Well, the commission. Uh, it's not about legal, Bruce. I mean, the commission can require a farmer to, you know do somersaults if you want. I mean, I'm joking, but um, yeah. it's not legal, legal. But I think I, my recollection of this was twofold. One, uh, the commission at the time was worried about abutters to conservation land. And should they, I don't know, should, you know, they they purchase their house and they're living in their house and and all of a sudden Farmer Brown is out there at six in the morning you know, harrowing or or whatever. Is there an expectation from abutters and residents who live, you know, near near uh, conservation land that they will enjoy peaceful whatever? Um, and and should they expect, you know, operations after dark? I think there was also consideration of impacts to wildlife and animals and such. But I think the main the main point was abutters. So that's why um, it's in there. On the other hand, if a guy wants to get his hay in before it rains and it's already dry, why can't he do it with the headlights of his tractor? A absolutely. Um, again, the commission at the time was putting the lens down that this is not private agricultural land. This is public conservation land. Got it. And Got it. abutters have expectations. Michelle? Um, well, I was wondering if maybe it could be site specific if there are or not but abutters. And then, um, oh yeah, the conservation lands are closed from or open from dawn to sunset or something. So I, I don't know if mm -hmm. we need to think about that, but mm -hmm. technically they're not supposed to be there. I think there's some flexibility on this. And, and like Michelle said, I, I like the idea of maybe it's case by case um uh field by field if you will so i think we could maybe bruce could work on some language that uh gives us some flexibility there okay. reason. i'll give it a try all right i um i have an issue that uh, or a question 
is actually an issue that I didn't raise, but I when I reread this, I did. It has the agricultural leaseholder contacting Dave if there is uh, some something required to go outside norm. And then when you read down, all of a sudden somebody's contacting staff and about, you know, including the farmers' conflicts between people and who the contact person is kind of bumps all bumps all around. And um, I didn't know if there was a reason that Dave was, uh, the, you know, somebody goes as high as Dave on daylight hours and yet contact staff on conflicts. And all I would ask is that we be consistent. Okay, I'll I'll read through with that in mind. Thank you. So yeah. can you scroll down more? Because I can't see the number where Alex had a comment. Uh, oh, it's 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 land management specifics section A, and he asks from outside sources. Yeah. Why, why outside sources? I don't know. Why limit it to that? Or compost materials from outside sources. Oh. Well, I don't know what an outside source is. is so that, that means that means I mean, material. That mean Wag Wagner's wood. Um, I think I think the commission at the time was worried about the introduction of invasives and things like that because compost coming from other sources. I mean, you know, you get Japanese knotweed seeds in all sorts of things, and in they come. So inside sources would be like uh, green manure. Oh, let me let me read this. Sorry. So um, I just want to jump in here if I could. Um, so a lot of a lot of um, agricultural producers will take compost from, like, say, um, private landowners and allow them to deliver their compost. For example, I think Brookfield Farm did this, like, where let's say you have like household chicken farmers um, and they have to dispose of their um, chicken waste that they'll allow them to bring it. Um, but there are other farms who will take um, anything from from uh, households. Like, for example, they'll allow um, people who like households who have their their um, compost waste to deliver it to a transfer station and they'll pick it up at the transfer station because they're using it to actually produce okay. compost. OK, um, but I sometimes that compost can contain meat um it's not always like what we would expect compost to be um usually people who are producing compost want it to be um free of proteins so just like vegetable stuff but sometimes people put meat and bones and stuff so if that's happening on conservation land it hey, could create a I was, um, I was in my comment <laughs> Talk okay. we could we could define that differently. I think Aaron's spot on. It's just it's just a contamination issue. It's we had years ago we had uh, somebody who was they were they were composting all these newspapers, thousands of pounds of newspapers, and the ink in newspapers is not necessarily organic. So where does that go when you compost it? Anyway, things like that. All right, I have to go, but um, I didn't have any um, pressing concerns about the rest of this. So good luck. I'm good with oh, it. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Right. So maybe we're fine with outside sources. Just leave it and I'll rescind my comment. Okay. And just leave it alone. Okay. Um the question I raised is it is it the wetland bylaw? Is it the towns or the commissions? Aaron, it's the commissions. Um <clears throat> Uh, bear with me while I catch up on this. Um, it's in I'll section B. Site specific. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, this is this gets a little deep in the weeds, but I'll try to sum it up. Um, under the um, exemptions under Wetland Protection Act and under our local bylaw, um, if there's an existing agricultural use on a property, so I'll give you an example like field edges. Let's say the property has been harrowed and used for um, row crops within the last five years, then then technically because it's been used within the last five years within that um, field footprint, they would be able to 
to use that area. Now, if it's an area that's um, within, say, riverfront or within a buffer zone and it hasn't been used in the last five years and it requires them to come in and like cut down trees or go into an area that hasn't been farmed, that wouldn't be exempt from an agricultural standpoint under WPA or our local bylaw. Okay, Fair. That, that's all fine. What I wanted to know is whose bylaw is it? Is it a town bylaw or a commission bylaw? Should um, the word be the town's wetland bylaws? I think would it be the town's wetlands bylaws? That's it, how we generally refer to it. Yeah, but I mean, it, it would be a case by case basis too. So if it's an existing, let's say there's but, a field, like I think has been. Aaron, I'm sorry, I, I, we're getting to. All I want to know is who's responsible for the bylaw, the town or the commission? Who wrote the bylaw? Who the, the who conservation? The, well, the the bylaw itself is the town. So the well, let's just the, let's just eliminate the word commission and let it go and just say in the wetland bylaws. Okay, that's fine. I, I would put I would put the towns myself. Towns. Let's let I I'll agree with Aaron. It's a town towns. bylaw. Okay, um, Alex asks whether. Can, can I just go back to buffer strips for a minute? Sure. Um, Aaron, I wanted to tease something out you said. And I don't know if I'm overthinking this, but couldn't we define, like we could say here is the tillable, here is the tillable acreage. It is from this stake to this stake to that stake to that stake. This is the field we're putting out there in a license. We don't, we don't authorize you to mow clear nothing beyond this. Figure out your field within this. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I mean, and then then we don't have to get into. We're not like regulating. We're still regulating the the license will govern how person farmer A, B, or C uses it, but yeah. we will define the field edge and say you cannot plant or till or or harrow beyond this point. I, I like that. I like saying the um town so staff will determine the limits of, of yeah, I think field that's easier buffers or something. Then, they don't have to get into the wetlands bylaw. We <laughs> yeah. will define the field for them. Mm -hmm. And it's very crystal clear. Sorry, Alex, I just thought that might be no, a that's, simpler that's way. A, that's a much better approach. Uh, can you capture that? Yep, I got it. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay. Moving, moving. on. Um, the next one has to do with uh, D. And the commission is aware of dogs and wildlife have the potential to damage and contaminate crops and will work with agricultural producers to help mitigate blah, blah, blah. This subject comes up in, I think, three different places. And yeah. here, I, you know, give me an example where wildlife contaminates crops. Those two words, wildlife contaminate. I know damage, but give me wildlife contaminates. Commission is aware that dogs and wildlife have the potential to damage and contaminate. Again, this was written by a previous commission. I'm crystal clear on dogs and contamination. I'm not sure why wildlife. I wonder whether this is a I, sentence construction issue, and and they were talking about they were talking about dogs damaging and contaminating. They were talking about wildlife damaging. They didn't really mean wildlife contaminating. That, there have been instances sense? of wildlife contaminating crops, and I can give you an example. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so um, there was, this is a, another state, but there was a, a an agricultural producer who was, who was doing um, orange juice, or I think it was orange juice, and there was um, uh, deer that were coming into the fields and um, living or eating foraging in the location and they ended up with an outbreak of I think it was E. coli from the deer accessing the field and and like several children got sick from the orange juice and the the farmer ended up getting sued um, so that's just one example but this happens quite a bit I mean deer are a good example but there's a lot like um, can, Canadian geese can come in and they um, go in the in the fields and if the vegetables aren't being washed a lot um, you know that that can transfer um, bacteria onto the onto the food. Mm -hmm. 
So where I'm challenged on this one is um, you, the, the the second part of the sentence to contaminate crop and will work with agricultural producers to help mitigate access challenges. It's so so to me, this is all about fencing, really. I mean, you're not, you know, I mean, fencing or, you know, for instance, geese, what if they wanted to use the cannons to keep geese off? So those are tangible okay. examples that Aaron kind of alluded you're to. You're not going to, you're not going to, there's another section in here that says that you're going to have to accept damage by wildlife, that there's <laughs> nothing you can do. There's, that's what? pretty close can in you, here. Well, can I you think, point, point to what section that is, where it says that? I think it's M. M. Well, just just so we're clear, just on dogs to be clear. So dogs can damage crops. That's that's pretty straightforward. But they're uh, all right? supposed to be on leashes. Correct, but but we know they're not. But the where we ran into uh, problems with dogs and contamination was in the organic standards. We had some uh, farmers who wanted to use Wentworth Farm. They went there one time and saw all the dogs running around, and they said, "We're out." They had no interest in in farming there at all because okay. they they couldn't uh, guarantee that the dogs weren't defecating in their fields. Okay, but this this subject matter is threaded through this, I think. In and I comment on it, um, Bruce. You've seen if you flip down to M, I know M is uh, maybe that's above or below. I don't know. Aaron, can you flip around? I mean, I'm just I trying to find it. Well, that's no-till farming. Um, yeah. Sorry. Well, anyways, it's in my comments that uh, okay. um, the, where we start to deal with mitigating damage, and there is a place where it says that um, farmers just sort of have to accept that. Yeah. So maybe, Bruce, you can find those. and I will try to, for the sure next draft, I'll try to figure out what to do with them. I think yeah, so what, they, they, what what so the commission yeah so what they, the commission so they don't com conflict right what the commission was trying to do and I think it's a valid point is say the the commission will work with the farmer if there are reasonable reasonable um, mitigation alternatives i.e. you know uh, the 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 an example is the community gardens at Amethyst Brook. The farmers there would like us, the gardeners there would like us to put a fence around the community gardens there so dogs can't get in and poop and mess up their early crop production or their uh, 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 propagation. Um, so I think that's a reasonable thing to ask. Can we do it? Uh, I don't know. It's expensive. So um, I, I think that's what we're trying to get at is there should be reasonable mitigation you know considerations but you're right alex wildlife is wildlife we can't keep moose deer uh woodchucks uh uh, uh, uh <laughs> beavers whatever out of their out of their right. and if, you go, if you go right to the top of this section the first sentence says uh first couple of sentences uh says uh the what will be considered if you aaron can you go right to the top the top right. of the document? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, it says here, only parcels where agricultural activities will not negatively affect blah, 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 blah. And then it lists um, other factors so all considered. Uh, there's a whole list of factors here. Site history, current projected uh, recreational use. I don't know what community development is or involvement, but there's... it it. It looks like, you know, the, the commission has a whole set of things to look at before it decides that a parcel will be leased out for agriculture. And maybe maybe um, this is a place to add some language, Bruce. I, I don't huh. have any suggestions, but uh, um, one of the my tough one of the things with these rules is it's it's. Things are scattered and not organized very well. If I was trying to use agricultural land, I'd have to really work my way down through here to figure out uh, what my responsibilities are, what's allowed, what's not allowed, and 
things it's almost in some cases like stream of consciousness the way it's organized so that's um uh what i was getting at there anyways let's move on mm -hmm. um trying to make sure we have room at the other end to talk about the two other agenda issues all right, this is uh, section F, page two. Um, I reached out to Brian. He told me what he knows about the gauge, uh, the, the gauge records. So. I got that. Uh, we'll incorporate that. Yeah. So, if we so could... this, this is a big issue. <laughs> this may be the biggest issue about licensing conservation land is irrigation. Yeah. Yeah. So if I could speak just for a minute about 10%, I stuck that in there. 10% um, is equivalent to 7Q10. 7Q10 is like the sickest day of your life in terms of stream life. That's the way it was explained to me by a very good 1930s type naturalist. And um, it's if you're a fish, it's like being crammed into the bathroom in a 13 room house and you're in there with every predator and the water's getting warm and you're having a hard time breathing and staying alive. 10% is not a comfortable state. And it is 7Q10 is the driest condition for seven consecutive days over 10 years. Um, or I think that's what it is. It's either, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not a healthy condition. So that's a real bedrock. And we could be higher than that, that they can't take water out uh, below 30% of mean annual flow. And 30% of mean annual flow is the vegetation line on the bank. Okay. So that's a point of discussion. Uh, which, so for this one, my proposal is I take what Ali just said, I go back to the water quality people that work that I work with on the Fort River stuff, see what they think, come up with a proposal that has some backing to it. Thank you. Can, can I just, uh, yeah, I'm fine with that. I think, um, can I just say I would, I would add with draw water from the Fort Mill amethyst or any other stream and we also have to consider ponds right you know we have ponds that are sources of water at various conservation areas so i would include ponds or, or okay. you could put body of water you know whatever you want to do i'm just saying it's more than the mill and the fort and Fair again enough. this is the number one issue for farmers licensing land is how will they irrigate? What will it cost? How easy or hard will it be? Okay. Yeah. Well, we can. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I think we should move towards trying to have wells on the properties where we have um, farming operations, as opposed to pumping water from waterways. It's just a better system. Mm. Yeah, if those wells are too close to the stream, they're stuck in water from the from the groundwater that feeds the stream. That's All true, right. but we could put pump limits. We could put a gauge on the well and limit the amount that they're pumping from it a little bit more, yeah. as opposed to just pumping from the water from the, from the. Let me let me work on that one. I'll work on that. Yeah, I don't know how many farmers want to undertake the cost of drilling a well. They'd much rather throw a pump in the water in the in the stream and and arrange you know pay for the gas to run it on, yeah. onward we're running out of time <laughs> yeah yeah let's yeah. just put a note on wells please okay wells, i got it work. come back to it yeah yeah okay so we're twelve thirty-eight. let's move on so if we can focus on <laughs> solutions to the question rather than background that'll speed us along well background's important background's Fair important enough. Okay, um, Alex, what did you mean? Uh, what about bees? Yeah, what about bees? I, in, in terms of background, Dave, I'd rather shoot for a solution if we need background. Right, Alex. I, I, I don't want to get into this, but 
I feel so rushed that some of these conversations are not all that productive for me personally. So I don't feel the same urgency you do to, to kind of move through this at lightning speed. I mean, you know, getting through this whole policy in 30 minutes, I, I don't know what that achieves for us. So I'm just giving you feedback based on, you know, this policy has been around for 10 years. I think some of the background is important. So I'm not feeling the same urgency of rush that you are. And I don't work well under those, those, uh, those conditions. So that's all I, I would rather be mindful and take it at a pace that is comfortable for everybody. So that's all. Well, please bear with me as chair. Yep. Uh, we are. So bees, I think the commission didn't consider bees, but I think it should be. Are, are you talking about bees raising bees or are you talking about bees as a, as a, as Beehive. a pollinator? Yeah. Beehives. For supporting a, 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 a crops on conservation land, that kind of thing. Yeah. What happens if a guy wants to put out uh, 12 hives and, you know, uh, raise honey? I think it wasn't considered back then and maybe we should. Can you work that in, Bruce? I'll work it in. Okay. And then um, down there, you had a question about caging. Um, there, are, in the in the in the egg business, there are definition of caged, cage free, and pasture, and it's all in terms of square feet. Um, and here, it 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 and based on some of the comments, it almost sounds like running free. Um, so when you said they are occasionally put in cages, there are fences. Um, and is anybody bothered by, by well, what are the comments on this will not be caged and will be pastured? Can you, um, Aaron, can you click on the, uh, the next, the one above it, just so you can see the whole thing? Um, I, I guess my thought here was that why are we in the business of telling the farmer how to raise their chickens? I mean, I, th I think what, what Bruce is getting at might be, or what they're getting at in this comment might be the battery cages, which battery cages are very different than sort of a standard chicken coop, um, chicken enclosure. Battery cages are really small where the birds are stacked on top of each other and they can't turn around. Um, so we might want to get more specific about what we're talking about here, um, but just an idea. Mm. So you could say we'll be pasture raised. Well, being pasture raised isn't the same necessarily as being in an enclosure. So like a pasture raised would be they put a big fence around the edge and the, they're just free range, essentially roaming, roaming free, but they've got a fence around them. But they, you know, you can also there uh, lots of farmers have movable enclosures, so they might right. have a cage, um, but it's like they pick it up and they put it on yeah. wheels and slide it. Um, so my suggestion on this one is that I dig into it deeper bring back a set of alternatives to this group as to what we want, to, what's the limit of our involvement in defining what gets raised and what doesn't. But we need, we need to, Alex's point is well taken that these things are more defined by the Department of Agriculture. And I need to know what those are before we put it in this document. Okay. Yeah, you might talk to somebody at Brook, you might get answers quicker if you talk to somebody at Brookfield Farm. <laughs> Yeah. Than the Department of Agriculture. Well, but, I also want to read what it actually says in the rule. But yeah. Gotcha. Anyway, um, then now can you highlight what I said about the that one? Yeah. So this feels very complicated to me. Um, that. <laughs> We're getting pretty deep into it in terms of defining what people are raising. I agree. I kind of agree with you, Bruce. Um, 
I mean, we might want to limit something like tobacco or, I mean, I don't know. I mean, why? The Valley is extremely well known for its tobacco. I mean, it's it's a major crop. I, I don't know. It yeah, just, yeah. I'm, I'm concerned that it's, that we're trying to do too much. Mm -hmm. You mean we're micromanaging? Yeah. And, and at some point, this lit, I mean, I agree that I didn't do too much more than just put it in, in an order with some letters, but at some point, we will discourage anyone from bid bidding on these um, properties because there's so many regulations. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a way to soften, K. I mean, I think it 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 is important to have a planting plan to know what people are planting, but maybe you're right. This is too restrictive. I, I'm trying to think of all, why did the commission? Why did they? They wanted food first. They wanted. I think the goal here was to mimic in some way the APR program. So the APR program, Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program in Massachusetts, it. It prioritizes the production of food. Well, maybe it's as simple as saying that. You know, so if a farmer is growing non, well, that's a great example. Tobacco is a great example. Are, are we, are we, are we, are we supportive of in the business of growing tobacco on public land in Amherst? versus growing lettuce for the consumption of human beings versus well, maybe tobacco. it's as simple maybe it's as simple as saying that we're going to have food we're only going to allow food crops what about but does that include animal food like hay <laughs> yes good question <laughs> Well, I, th I think hay feeds horses well hay feeds yeah cows. right you see yeah <laughs> And sometimes farmers also plant um, like a seed crop, like a, say like a high bush blueberry with the intention of actually removing it from the ground and putting it in a pot to sell it. So there's an implication that if you're planting something that it could have impacts to the topsoil and removal of the topsoil from the site at the end of the term. Yeah. So why don't, I, why don't you work that section a little and we, we prioritize food production? Let me let me work on it. That makes sense to people. Next. No till farming. Yeah. Side comment. I was in grad school in the seventies. And no-till farming was just coming on. And um, it's amazing how slow it has been in taking hold. And my wife's family are dairy farmers in Middlebury, Vermont area. And they no-till. They no-till their cornfields. And then they go out and they spray rotenone, not rotenone, rot Rotenone? No, not rotenone. That's water. Um, the hell am I thinking of? Roundup. Yeah, Roundup. They 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 spray Roundup on the ground uh, to kill the weeds, and um, and then they plant the corn. So that's why I said um, no till farming usually comes with herbicides, and yet we want people to be organic farming. Okay, well, so, it looks so, like another one to for me to dig into. This says encourages no-till. It doesn't require it, right? Right. So why wouldn't we encourage it? But it's not a negative if they don't use it. Oh, I, I agree with that. But it, yeah. it, we just have to understand that no-till usually comes with some herbicides, and some of those may be allowed under the organic rules. Mm -hmm. Yep, gotcha. Again, I think Brookfield does some no-till. I don't know. 
I don't know their whole crop rotation and all that, but yeah. it might be uh, kind of interesting to get comment from an agricultural producer like Brookfield on this. Like, you know, once we have mm -hmm. a good draft going, it might be kind of interesting to get some feedback. Yeah. yeah. There is um, plowing destroys soil structure and the little nodules that are that are made when then when soil is not disturbed and it just destroys them and um which is why no-till was was came about um uh, it's great but um not without not without uh it's 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 slow to catch on i think it's great that we promote it i don't have a problem with it but Anyways, um, Alex, I have a suggestion. Yeah. Um, to let me dig into the the last of these. If I have a question, they're yours. If I have a question, I can reach out and say, what did you mean by this? Because we're going to have another draft of this anyway. And I agree. We should take the next 10 minutes to at least talk about the site visit so we people can start to have a schedule. I think that would be terrific. Thank you. <clears throat> We got 10 minutes. Um, so uh, I suggest, thanks Dave, by the way, for this list. I know that took a while to think about. And I would like to put out there a suggestion that we focus on A, the agricultural sites, because we've got the agricultural policy in front of us. And coupled with this, try and grapple with your, your higher level policy question of do we need more? Uh, we we have two jobs. One is to finish up the document we were handed so we can give it back to the commission. And you want us to add a, a, a paragraph to each one with addressing uh, the high level policy questions if they pertain, such as, should we have more agricultural use? And we haven't, so far, we've just been focusing on the words in the document that we got to work on and we have never talked about the overall policy question, which we need to. And so I'm hoping that by focusing on the agricultural sites, you will lead us um, in a discussion about, do we need more? Rather than jumping to B and C and D, we could get agriculture done. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Me. Order of preference about the sites? Are they in, already in the order of preference? Um, and Aaron may want to weigh in on this. I put them because they represent, you know, Fort River Farm has both existing community gardens and the potential for other agricultural uh, um, activities to happen. And it was purchased with that specific intent was to find a balance there between agricultural agriculture and conservation. Amethyst Brook as a less formal community garden, but the potential for other gardening or, or production, food production to happen. Wentworth Farm is just, you know, clearly a former farm and has some pretty extensive fields and is a is a good laboratory for kind of looking at what what uh, is possible. Um, and it's also a place to look at some of the challenges of irrigation. Podic, Zala is a, a Podic is an old conservation area, Zala, a relatively new one we acquired, and there's potential there for agriculture. So mm -hmm. th these are all just good places to visit and have conversations. And I thought it would spur our conversations about kind of, do we want to encourage more? What are some of the upsides and downsides of, of doing this? You know, we'll look at parking, we'll look at trash removal, structures, water, access to water, irrigation, um, those kinds of things. Aaron, were there any other uh, places for possible Tilling. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of agriculture, there's there's 
like license locations for for ag producers and then there's you know other alternative agriculture so like potentially community gardens um or you know like if it wasn't leasing to an agricultural producer, maybe it's leasing to an organization like a community group that does indigenous growing or something to that effect. But I mean, a couple others I had. Well, any, any of these could be that too. So yeah, right. absolutely. I'm glad you reminded yeah. me of that. Yeah. So just to keep all those pieces in mind, like what is it appropriate for, you know, um, as we're talking about it, but like Haskins Meadow is one that we've historically licensed and has been farmed, but recently the, the license expired and, you know, Dave and I were talking sort of internally whether, because it's right on Cushman Brook, should we keep doing that or should we think about not doing it anymore? Um, the other one is is Larch Hill, and I'm thinking about this from a very geographic sense because I'm a geographer. So I'm thinking like we should pick one in Central Amherst, one North Amherst, one in South Amherst. Um, so like Larch Hill is a, could be potentially for community gardens, but I wouldn't say it would be a great place for like um, large scale agriculture for leasing. Um, let me see what else. Larch Hill. We had Mount Pollux, Elf Meadow, Haskins Meadow, and I think the others were already captured. <clears throat> on your list places yeah and i yeah well can those we are, those are good additions yeah yeah it's but i thought we were talking about agricultural sites those are potential oh, is an agricultural site yeah there's about a 10 acre field at the southern end of uh mount Pollux <laughs> that is just a hay field uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I know where that is. I didn't. I didn't look at it as. I don't think it's in agriculture now. Uh, it's it's a hayfield. Yeah. Okay. It just it's got been, by me. <laughs> it's what that? It got by me. Yeah. I'm Would sorry. it be too uh, too aggressive to try to do one a week for oh. two months? Yeah, I think that would be too aggressive. For me, the other thing is, I think we can do some of these very quickly. These are not; these might be twenty-minute, you know, fifteen-minute stops. We can do multiple. We can do multiple of these in one. You know, if we do a two-hour block or an hour and a half block, we can we can visit a lot of these, take photos, have a have a conversation. You know. Well, if okay. we break it up by like North Central and South Amherst, like we could yeah. potentially hit, say, like three sites in North Amherst one day, three sites in Central Amherst. I mean, just to like keep the geography of driving around less, too, that might make sense. Why don't we do this? Erin and oh, I, Erin and I can refine this list with the additions she just suggested. We can we can uh, arrange them geographically. And then we can we can arrange these dates by email, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Because these are just site yeah. visits. Yeah. And then you know, if we did one yeah, we every every other week, Bruce, that might work better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We constantly deal with Aaron's workload, and you your your schedule is. Uh, we're both we're busy. Yeah, we're both just busy. We're all busy. So, uh, but we can we can fit this in, and I like the idea of front loading the agricultural sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank and you. I'd like to make sure that um, Michelle can make it. I I I would almost insist that we find a time and a way to make to allow Sh Michelle to be there because we're so few people on this subcommittee. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Does anybody have days that really don't work for them for site visits? Not at Tuesday the moment. Morning. Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. Okay. Um, I can ask Michelle what days work for her, and we'll I'll I'll ask her that offline, and then when Dave and I sort of try to organize these a little bit, we'll try to keep in mind scheduling on days when Michelle can make herself available. Okay. Yeah. Aaron, Aaron, could you just list? It was Elf Meadow, Larch Hill, uh, Haskins. I think Haskins would be good to visit to really. That's a good, I, I, some of these I put on here to contrast another one, like Haskins would be a good kind of a contrast to say, wow, look at this. Look at all these natural resources, uh, turtle habitat, uh, riparian zones. Do we really want to, you really want to till this? Hmm. Um, so there was Elf Meadow, Larch Hill, Haskins. What else? Um, uh, Mount Pollux. 
Mount I just Pollux. want to make sure I got them all. So Mount Pollux, Elf Meadow, I have Fort River Farm, Amethyst, Wentworth, you have Larch Hill, Zolopodic, which you have, Haskins Meadow. Yep. Okay. Those were on my list for okay. the agricultural discussion. So we'll group these and Aaron uh, will arrange uh, the first couple of site visits. And I bet we could do this whole list. What do you think, Aaron, in two visits, two site visits? I bet we could if we're, if yeah, we're fast. two different dates. I mean, yeah, yeah um, I think most of them are North Amherst or Central Amherst. I think there's only the one in South or maybe Mount Pollux and Elf Meadow are probably the two South. And there's, not a, lot, there's not a lot of walking. It's really quite accessible. We mm -hmm. just park, boom, there it is. You know, Fort River Farm is probably the most walking. Or, oh, Michelle. or Wentworth. Wentworth is a good yeah, Wentworth is. Wentworth is, yeah. Yep. Michelle's availability is pretty restrictive. And plus, she's she's um, got other things going on besides earning a living. Yeah. Uh, okay. You know, she's chair of the the conservation commission she's on the cpac yeah right which is still going on yep okay. and I, this is, I just soon get it done time. while we've got mild weather and before we get into february march mm -hmm. so if we put together can we try and focus the conversation on the pros and cons you mentioned mm -hmm. some so yep. we can get at the come away as a result of these sites, come away with a a sense amongst us about the, do we need more policy question? Yeah, and if we're doing site visits, we should definitely focus on information gathering as opposed to deliberation in the field. Otherwise we have to post it as a public meeting. Yeah. So my image is that I'll redo this uh, draft for the next whenever our next meeting of this group is and then modify it one more time after the site visits okay it's one o'clock thank you everybody what about the next meeting day um that would be two weeks from now and hold on let me get a calendar up on my phone i believe um january 2nd would be our next I can I can do that. I can. I am going to be away, but feel free to meet without me. And do do we know what we want to talk about at the next meeting specifically? The next draft of the agriculture. Okay, we'll put and keep agriculture then, on. And then there was one other thing on. Uh, we can we can just work on some of the other policy things if there's time. Yeah, we have okay. a tough time getting through more than one policy topic. Right. <laughs> never, yeah, that's okay. Never been, able, never been able to do that. But we need to talk about what which policies to take on next okay. so, that's, that's so like that, that somebody can get it done. And so that'll be another agenda item for that call because we're out of time for this one. Right. We have a tough time getting more than three things done in this hour. Think of the shock if we ended at 45 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thanks. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.